Well, let's hear you. Well, I'll, I'll start, actually, since you're nodding, uh, David, uh, with you. I mean, there is a big argument, isn't there, about um, government getting in the way? Yeah. Regulations, red tape, etc. Yeah. I mean, from defence perspective, we do have red tape on what we can sell outside the bounds of the country, quite rightly. So we are naturally restricted in that respect. However, I think the larger companies do have a responsibility to their supply chain. So we have 1,700 SME suppliers in Australia, and we have taken on a commitment to actually open up our supply chain on a global basis. So our company in the UK, our company in the US, we are opening up opportunities for our supply chain to engage with those people. Um, and this is a real opportunity, I think, for us to maintain capability in the supply chain when things get a little bit lean in the Australian market. It's called the Global Access Program, and uh, we're very keen and very supportive of it. Uh, global Access is, uh, is a, is a double-edged sword, isn't it? I heard someone on the radio this morning when asked, uh, this is in Victoria as a matter of fact, when asked, um, what are all these car components manufacturers going to do? in the future and uh, and it was suggested well there's all these new and innovative things they could be making um, and then the, the interviewer said um, well if you were going to make a new and innovative thing why would you just make it in China where it's cheaper yeah um, how do you how do you solve that problem well it's back to the earlier comments it's about where have we innovated where have we automated where have we invested in new technology where we can be competitive and those are the sort of businesses that I'm in, interested in maintaining, frankly. Um, and at the same time, I want them to grow because I am dependent upon their skill set going forward to support our products. Yeah. Let's hear from uh, Joran on this. And uh, can, can I just throw one thing in, Joran, having sort of looked at your report? Um, you talk about the role of government uh, in procurement areas, uh, in regulation. Regulation of government could lead to innovation. Um, I don't know whether that's what you're about to reflect on at that point, but nonetheless, you can make your own comment and then think about that as well. I now will reflect on that, apparently. There we go. Um, what I thought I'd say is a few things around uh, the Asian market. And, I mean, and, and let's take China as an example. It's, of course, an enormous market, and you can be greatly successful there. But it's also to realize that these countries go through the same um, phases as we do. I mean, um, the, the salaries in China will be roughly on the U.S. level next year. Okay. So anybody who thinks they're going to go to China to make cheap labor, they can forget about that, right? rough about that. Uh, there is also issues about the cost of, of um, institutional imperfections and other things in countries like China, which we should not, not forget. So we go through, at the moment, we are in the third phase of globalization. The first one was when we moved production activity to somewhere else because it was cheaper. The next phase was where we moved services, administration, R&D to other places were cheaper. That's where most OECD countries tend to be. Uh, and the third phase, and we start to bring them back, because actually when we are in the business of producing things with high value for money, it is cheaper to do so in a high cost environment than it is in a low cost environment. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see that third phase moving in in places like Germany and a few things, and even in the US. Now at the same time as that happens, China enters the first phase. Most furniture, Chinese furniture manufacturers today outsource their production to Vietnam. So they are going through the same phases as you are with the same challenges. So don't believe that this is something unique for us. It's just a time issue. So that, that was the first thing I just wanted to say. And, and, you know, it's a big market. We need to deal with it, but it isn't easy. But if it succeeds, it's great. And by the way, we should think about Indonesia. It's big and closer. Um, the, um, the other thing I'd like to do is to reflect on, on government's role, and I will use a few examples to that when you ask me to talk about procurement and regulations. So start, let's start with regulation shortly and briefly. Regulation is a fantastic tool to drive innovation if you do it well. The best jurisdiction that has done this forever is California. California imposes regulations that cannot be achieved with today's technology in several industries. And they basically say, if you don't get there by a given timeline, you can't sell. You know, that's it. We don't want to have you here. That is what's driven developments in the automotive industry for exhaust, exhaust environments. That's what's driven the ability of, by, I think it's 2016, if you can't use, say, 40% of the energy that comes through from the sun in the wind of the car, you know, to something useful in the car, you will not be allowed to sell a car in California. Now, every time, of course, industry wails, you know, this is outrageous. And at one interview I saw, you know, on TV in the U.S., 
uh, one of these uh, interviewers asked a government official, so how should the industry solve this? And the answer was brilliant in my humble opinion, because the official said, I have no idea. That's not my problem. That's why we have industry. They'll figure it out or they won't sell and they don't want to end up there. Okay? So, so regulation is quite good in things like building and construction activities and stuff like that. So you can do it. That is different from red tape. Red tape you should get rid of as quickly as you can. These are different types of, of, of regulations. You're, I'm, I'm going to just hold you on the procurement yeah. issue, and I'll bring Greg uh, Combe in, because he wanted to uh, jump into this point. Please. Please. Yeah. Thank, we'll thank come you, back. Tony. I was very pleased to hear David's comments just then about that global supply chain access, and I want to underline just um, what important, albeit sometimes small roles, governments can play. Because in 2007, when uh, I was part of the government elected federally, I was put in charge of defence material acquisitions and sustainment. And at that stage, the Commonwealth Government was spending about 10 or $11 billion a year in acquiring military equipment and in sustaining it. But we didn't have a program in place, despite the fact that almost all BAE systems revenue was derived from Australian taxpayers, along with all the other major defence uh, companies, and that flowed down to hundreds and uh, thousands of, of small and medium-sized enterprises, we didn't have a program in place to oblige BAE systems or any of the other prime manufacturers to take our SMEs into global supply chains. And yet we were paying for all this gear, the only customer involved. And we put that program in place and it immediately bore results. It was also put in place in relation to the auto industry, it's worth noting, so that when the arguments such as on Q&A last night just hand out gifts to these companies, one of the programs under the automotive assistance was to oblige General Motors and Toyota and Ford to take SMEs in their supply chain to equip them, make sure they meet the standards and to get them into their global supply chain. And it was a struggle to do that, not a lot of companies made it. But active government policies of that nature can help. We put in place other measures as well to encourage, and, and it existed in South Australia as well, to encourage on major contracts for procurement uh, the successful tenderers for those contracts to use SMEs in the local yeah. economy to provide goods and services. Well, on, on a neoclassical analysis, that potentially contributes to an inefficient allocation of capital. Uh, but on a social and economic analysis, I think that's a more rational one, it leads to good outcomes. And those are the judgments we're going to have to make. And as we sit here discussing today, where to for South Australia, almost all the discussion, bar Alps contribution, I think, I hope you're not too lonely, mate, <laughs> but, but almost all the discussion is about how governments can intervene to meet these um, objectives and to deal with market failures. And there's a very important role for government in that respect. You've got to get the balance right. You don't want to lead to patently inefficient economic outcomes, but you can also do a lot of good. Okay, well, here's, uh, I'll put you on the spot then, because um, you were in government for a while, and uh, you were in defence for a while, uh, from uh, my recollection, and uh, one of the biggest uh, decisions that a government could have taken but didn't would have been what to do about where to make the future submarines of Australia. Now, that's precisely the sort of government initiative and investment which could actually save vast numbers of manufacturing jobs, not only in South Australia, but also in Victoria. So your thoughts on that? Was that a failure of your government to make a decision? And, uh, and will that be addressed, do you think, in the current government? Well, I am disappointed, to be perfectly honest about it, that we didn't take more decisions to progress that project. I think um, it's an important project that we need to pursue from a national security point of view, and it would be transformative of our manufacturing industry. That is such a large-scale undertaking, uh, which is justified on our national security capability grounds, uh, that we should get on with it. And uh, while my time in the portfolio, I endeavoured to progress it along, uh, we haven't taken it far enough. And um, I think it's one of these things that governments tend to think it's so big so complex, and no one wants to have you know, another Collins class kind of thing tagged to them uh, you know, in, in the notoriety of it, not the actual performance of those submarines, but um, governments and ministers are very reticent to take those decisions. I'd like to see decisions taken that at least take us a few steps down the path. 
There are opportunities, for example, that we've learnt from the Collins-class submarine build uh, that we can do some things, just build a propulsion system on land and work it over for thousands of hours so that we know exactly how it's going to perform before we stick it inside a submarine. We can, uh, and have taken steps to, to acquire the intellectual property to evolve the Collins-class submarine design. We have ASC, the Australian Submarine Corporation in this state, governments of all, or political parties have all indicated that South Australia is the place where the next generation submarine is going to be built. We've got a lot of the capability here. We're in the middle of a major shipbuilding exercise with the air warfare destroyer. We've got to get on with it, and, and it's going to take a fair bit of courage, uh, and there'll be a lot of complaints and a lot of moans that we can't possibly do it, but I'm actually fed up with that. We can do these things, and you have to learn along the way there's been issues with the air warfare destroyer project. Well, it's not surprising, in a sense. These are big, complex undertakings with massive, di massively difficult systems integration, let alone the application of design into a shipbuild. But we can do that. And if we do do that, it would not only transform this state, it'll transform manufacturing throughout the country. Is